delighted that my guest is Joshua Hatton. Joshua is the National Sales Director for Impex Beverages. He's also the founder of Single Cask Nation, an independent bottler, and he hosts the One Nation Under Whiskey podcast. He's a keeper of the quich, which is a recognition of his contribution to the world of whiskey. And if that's not enough, he's also the bass player in the band Kimono Dragon, a progressive punk rock band, and they are currently recording their fifth album. And I met Joshua at a reform congregation on the Connecticut shoreline a number of years ago. Uh, so this is one of these episodes where we are meeting a whiskey professional who happens to be Jewish. I'm wonderful to have you here. And we're going to jump right in with what's your dram today? Firstly, thank you for having me on your podcast, Rabbi. I'm excited to talk and I'm excited to sip on this. Let me see if my camera gets it there. So uh, Single Cast Nation is my company. We're an independent bottler. And this is a bottling of a single cask from the m &H distillery out of Tel Aviv. It's um, So it's single malt whiskey, but being Israeli, single malt Israeli whiskey rather than single malt Scotch whiskey. And it's a, a three-year-old of, of their peated spirit matured in uh, a cask that previously held bourbon. Wonderful. And yeah. uh, I happen to have had a bottle of this waiting in my home, so I'm able to join you as we have a chance to explore this a little bit. Uh, but first of all, tell us a little bit more about a peated whiskey uh, from Israel, uh, because I'm um, thinking for anybody who's been there that we, we don't really kind of visualize peat bogs in, in Israel. So what's the source of the malted barley that's gone into making the spirit? Yeah, it's it's funny you ask that. You know, I, I asked the M&H guys the same thing, and they gave me an answer that I also was not expecting, right? You don't expect peat from Israel. You expect peat from Scotland, and this is actually uh, peated. The, the barley that they used is peated barley from the Czech Republic. So it's Czech peat, Czech barley with Czech peat. And so you get just very different flavors and scents coming from it because the vegetation within the Czech Republic is it's quite different than what you would see, say, on Isla in Scotland, where, you know, those Isla whiskeys give you that medicinal kind of iodine smell, sea coast, sea breeze kind of smell. Uh, you know, this is more vegetal. It's, it's almost floral, if you will, you know, that kind of floral smoke. It's almost pretty, I'd say. Yeah, the floral notes really come through. It's uh, yeah. yeah, much, much of more of a, a sweeter nose to it than you would normally expect from a, a peated whiskey. Yeah. Uh, yep. So, so yeah. So now, and this is a single cask, so it's bottled at cask strength. Mm -hmm. uh, so walk us through this uh, a little bit. Yeah. So actually, uh, I'll a little peek behind the curtain. Even though this is fifty nine point three percent alcohol it's actually not cask strength. Um, if we bottled this at cask strength, it would have been closer to 66% alcohol. And, and, and I'll try to give you a quick reason as to why that is. And it has to do in part to this age statement here. There's a connection to this age statement. You know, um, cask strength whiskeys coming out of Scotland typically tend to be, you know, 50s percent alcohol, something like that even until they get to the age of 15, 18, 20, 25 years old, um, Israel's different because the climate is quite different. You know, in, you know, in Scotland, it's, it's cold, it's, it's rainy, and you have what's known as an angel share or, you know, sort of an, an annual um, evaporation rate of around one and a half to 2%, you know, uh, but in Israel, in Tel Aviv specifically, you're looking at 10 to 12% angel share. And because it's a bit drier in Israel than it is in Scotland, what's evaporating is a lot of the things that aren't alcohol within the cask, right? It's pulling the, 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 the water from the cask out. So you're losing volume, but you're gaining alcohol. So they, they fill the casks at the same you know, 63, 63 and a half percent alcohol 
that the Scots do that's just traditional. But in Israel, the ABV kind of goes up as the years go on. And because the angel share is so high, you know, they're losing, you know, that 10 to 12% year over year from the cask at three years of age, you know, it's really almost matured like a, an eight, 10 or 12 year old Scotch whiskey. So everything happens real fast. And so, yeah, so it, it, it's not cast strength, but we brought it down to an ABV that we, me and my business partner, Jason, thought was very approachable for our palate, but was also high enough so that if, if people felt that, well, you know, maybe the alcohol is too much for their palate, they can get some water and, and add a dash of water in, or if, if they like ice cubes, they can do that too. But we, we like... For us, you know, alcohol equals flavor. So the highest you can get it without lighting your mouth on fire, uh, the better. Because with that alcohol comes all of that flavor, you know? Absolutely. No, in fact, yeah, when I think about cost strength whiskeys that I have tried where I've gone, oh, I can drink this without the water. I can add a little water and get a different set of notes, but it's very palatable. It's often at that 58, 59 kind of percent mm. level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I'm going to take a, a dram of this with you. Mm. Mm, that sweetness that was there in the sort of the nose, sort of with the, it's such a unique blend of sweet and peat together, uh, but not like the sweetness that comes when you take a you know something like a Lafroy and put it in a in a you know in a sherry or a big cask. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's 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 very different the kind of sweetness you're getting. So yeah. tell, how would how would you describe some of the notes that you're picking up here? It, for me, it starts off quite citrusy almost, you know, like Meyer lemons. It's very, very lemony forward. Um, but behind that, it's more, hold on one second. This is for scientific purposes, of course, Rabbi. You know, behind that is is almost like um, like a baked pear sweetness, right? It's that it's it's this this sweet pear, the sugar from the pear, but you've got the cinnamon on there, and you've got a bit of nutmeg going on. You've got that warmth. You know, there there's that warmth associated with the sweetness. Where, like you had said, if you put a Laphroaig in, into a sherry cask, you're going to get dates and figs and prunes and sort of these sort of darker fruit sweetnesses where this is lighter fruit sweetness. Yeah, it's really palate. quite a yeah. unique, quite a unique profile. And, and it's interesting because I was thinking about what you were saying before about where they get their peated barley from, you know, what makes an Israeli whiskey an Israeli whiskey, you know, you're, mm. you're taking, uh, you know, your source uh, malted barley from the Czech Republic. Yeah. And yet, it's that process of the heat and the humidity uh, in Tel Aviv, the aging process there, and how uh, the wood is, you know, drawing the whiskey in that particular climate that really gives you something that is unique. That would not, it would be a, a totally different whiskey if you'd aged it in the Czech Republic. It, it really would be, and you you bring up a good point, you know, about what what makes a whiskey a whiskey of whatever country it is. You know, most Scotch whiskey gets their barley, Scotch whiskey producers get their barley from England or France or, you know, outside of Scotland. So, you know, when, when we think about wine, we always think of it being very terroir driven, uh, grape variety and where were those grapes grown and how, what was the wind like and, and all of this stuff. For whiskey, you don't really have that. A lot of those terroir sort of signifiers, flavor signifiers get distilled out. And then what you're left with is quite often, um, you know, the, the process to, to make the whiskey, um, but, but the casks and the environment in which the casks are matured. And so with, with M&H, they've got five climate zones, right? They've got Tel Aviv, the Dead Sea, Jerusalem, uh, upper Galilee, and then they've got the deserts, and they're maturing whiskey in all five climate zones. And then on top of that, they're playing around with different sorts of casks. You know, they are a kosher distillery, so they're they're using kosher Israeli wine casks, and they're using pomegranate wine casks, and they're 
you know, what's more Israeli than maturing whiskey at the Dead Sea, where you've got an angel share of 25%, you know? So it's, they're doing a lot of stuff to, to say, yes, some of what we get comes from outside of Israel, but this is definitely an Israeli product while always sort of having a bit of a nod to the, to the origin of, of malt whiskey, which, you know, they deem to be Scotland. Some may argue Ireland. I'll stick with Scotland. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely. I think, I mean, that, that also comes through with all of the yeah. M&H products is that the influence is definitely the Scotch mm. single malt whiskey is sort of the, 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 the source of the inspiration, even though yeah. it's taken on a uniquely Israeli flavor. Uh, so I'm going to add just a drop of water, take one more dram of this, uh, just to see um, what happens when I just open it up with just a okay. touch of water. Oh, I should have, I should have brought water. You're more professional than me. <laughs> now that for sure is not, it's not so, but we're going to come to that in just a moment. You know, what I'm getting is um, like, it's like, like the creme brulee brown sugar is Ooh. sort of opened up so you talked about the sort of the, the sweetness of like the cooked pears it's mm. like it's like imagine that sort of crunchy brown sugar sort of toasted that that uh and toasted flavors um yeah. uh, i'm getting a little bit more of that coming to the fore when the the water just opens it up a little bit that's a beautiful dram so oh, thank oh, you I for introducing that, that. <laughs> thank, thank <laughs> you it's not not everybody is willing to take a chance on a on a whiskey so young um, I mean, that's, that's definitely changing. So I, I appreciate you taking a chance on, on a three-year-old and it just goes to show, right? A age doesn't matter. Age is not a signifier of quality. It just signifies sometimes how much money may come out your wallet. You know? That's right. When the whiskey's <laughs> ready, the whiskey's ready. And that's yeah, going to be different exactly. in different places. So it's a, a wonderful way to learn about that. So I want to come to the, the drush and, uh, Joshua, you spend your live, you know, your 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 life telling the stories of other people's whiskeys. Mm -hmm. uh, you are a representative for Impex, which is an importer, a distributor of a lot of uh, small independent uh, distilleries, producers, uh, wonderful range of whiskeys from Scotland, from uh, from Wales, from uh, from now from Israel. And uh, now also from Yorkshire, uh, you know, a, a quite a, a, yeah. a, an array of, of wonderful sourced whiskies. And, uh, you know, you started life, a uh, you know, nice Jewish boy in Connecticut. Uh, <laughs> what's the journey that takes you to, um, uh, to this? The, today, we're going to have an opportunity to hear your story. Sure. So a little bit of, of how, how did you get here? Yeah. Um... So I, this is going to sound weird, especially as we're talking about alcohol, but hear me out and follow me through to the end. I have a very addictive personality, an incredibly addictive personality. Now, when it comes to drinking alcohol, I'm not an alcoholic. I go many days without, a lot of my drinking is more tasting and approving cask samples. What I mean by having an addictive personality is that when I find something that that moves me or that inspires me in, in any way, shape or form, that becomes a rabbit hole to me. And I just want to follow that down. And I kind of get, you know, horse blinders on and, and, and I just want to pay attention to that, whatever it is, and learn about it. And, you know, for years, it was guitars and amplifiers and guitar pedals and things like that and music and that remains true, but for whiskey, it was interesting. I, you know, my wife and I had just moved to Guilford, Connecticut, and we were uh, at, at a new synagogue to us, Temple Beth Tikva, uh, where I met you. And there, after a Kabbalat Shabbat service, there was a congregant there who he would just bring whiskey every week, you know, and you just during the Oneg, he would. You just have whiskey. If you wanted to try it, you wanted to try it. And and I was interested. I want to say this was around 2005 or so. And I was quite interested to finally taste the whiskey. Um, I, I spent much of my, you know, 20s just, just staying far away from drinking, period. I, I just wasn't a drinker. It wasn't my thing. 
Um, but I was curious about flavor. And so I went to him and I said, uh, I'm, I'm really curious to try whiskey. What, what do you have? And he said, well, do you like sweet? Do you like smoky? Do you like spicy? And I said, wait a second. I didn't know a, a drink could be smoky. I love smoky things. So, you know, what's that all about? And so he poured me, um, uh, a little pour in a, like a, like a kiddish cup of Lagavulin 16. And, and, you know, a lot of people that would be like the nail in the coffin for them. They would just never want to revisit whiskey, scotch whiskey again. But for me, I nosed that and tasted it. And, and, and part of the reason why I stayed away from alcohol for most of my twenties is because I was so against, I was really against drinking. I didn't like the idea of using something only to get you from point A to point B. That, that was not interesting to me. But when I smelled this, I was transported back in time to going camping with my dad, you know, smelling, smelling mm -hmm. the smoke from the campfire, the damp leaves, you know, the, the, the soil, like all of those scents were there. And what turned me on about this whiskey was exactly, it did exactly what I was hoping. It wasn't something that would just take me from point A to point B. It actually transported me back in time. Like it was doing something that I wasn't expecting. And that, that blew my mind and it, it just wanted me to explore more. And so so I started, you know, again, this was 2005, right? And so I started looking at blogs and things like that. And, and I discovered whiskey blogs and whiskey bloggers. And I wanted to know what they liked. And I wanted to know what they found interesting. And so I spent a couple of years discovering whiskey through them. And then I started my own whiskey blog, along with my, my now business partner, Jason. He had his own whiskey blog, a Scot Scotsman now, now stateside. And our blogs had gotten so popular. Uh, it used to be called, my blog used to be Jewish Single Malt Whiskey Society com, which just blows off your tongue. I changed it to Jew Malt, which was a lot funnier and quite shorter. And, uh, you know, we got to the point where we, we had so much traffic to our blog, people wanting to know what we thought about someone else's whiskey. We said, what if we bottled whiskey that we fell in love with? And, and those same people who read our blogs may be customers of ours because they appreciated our palate. They made buying decisions based on what we thought was good. And, and so that's how we, that's how the business got started. It was, we, we saw an opportunity there. I mean, yes, it was financial, but it was also pa completely passion driven. You know, it was this great opportunity to turn people on to distilleries they may not have ever heard of. And, and that, excited us, you know, to get people as jazzed up about whiskey as, as we were. And if we can make a bit of money along the way, even better. That's, yeah, it's a wonderful, there's so many pieces to that story. It's a wonderful story. I love the, the way that that first sniff of that Lagavulin took you back to a, you know, a childhood memory. Because I think so much of, you know, some people say like, for people who aren't whiskey drinkers, and, and I think there'll be people listening to this uh, podcast who are interested in the people that we bring to the podcast, the guests and the stories who may or may not be whiskey drinkers uh, and may remain not being particularly whiskey drinkers, but there's something about this particular drink, this liquid, that mm. there's such range, there's so many different kinds of whiskey uh, at the, that those smell and taste are those two things that really take us back to memory. I, I know this even, even at the most basic level when I'm teaching you know, young people about Jewish festivals, mm. you know, year after year, if they, I don't expect a young child to remember the Hebrew date of something or very specific facts, informational facts about a holiday. But if I say, you know, what do you hear on Rosh Hashanah? They're all gonna say shofar. If I say, yeah. what, do you, what do you taste? apples and honey, like there's sounds and there's tastes and they yeah. are immediately are embedded in memory. And, and whiskey has such an array of that, that 
it really is something that is about the story and, and about those memories. So it's a wonderful way of presenting whiskey and what a wonderful introduction. And, and just by chance introduced in the context of you know, a synagogue and someone yeah. at an on egg. It's just a, a wonderful story. I, I'm really intrigued because clearly the work you've gone on to do, the, the single, we're going to come, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the the, the, the single, you know, the, the single cast nation and the bottling that you do. Sure. Uh, but uh, a lot of the work you do and now working for Impex, there's nothing that's, you know, uniquely or specifically Jewish about that. But in your own journey, both in terms of your blog and also the whiskey festival that you ran for a few years, mm -hmm. uh, you did have a very explicitly sort of Jewish part of your identity was woven into how you were doing whiskey. And I'd just love to hear a little bit more about how those different pieces of who you are kind of got woven together in that yeah. whiskey journey. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the fact of the matter is single cast nation is a brand owned by my company, Jewish whiskey company. Right. So, so that, that starts it off. Um, you know, the, the festival that we did, which was called whiskey Jubilee and Jubilee with, a, with a, a Jew, you know, just, just to make it fun. Um, was it was an interesting thing for us we we never wanted to get into the the whiskey festival business that, that was never our intention our intention was always to be an independent bottler of primarily scotch whiskey and you know what else could we bottle rums american whiskeys mezcal etc but it was in 2012 where whiskey fest which is i think the the us's largest whiskey festival uh for some reason, switched from a Tuesday, Wednesday to a Friday, Saturday event. And, and we, so we had a bunch of producers who had, you know, people flying into town for the New York Whiskey Fest. And they said, we're not going to have any customers. I don't know if you've been to the New York Whiskey Fest, but there's more, there's more kipot than there are kilt. I mean, it really is a Jewish event. There's a lot of black hats and beards and like it is a very Jewish event. And wow. uh, and and so we had importers and distributors saying, can you do something for us? Because we have a feeling we simply won't see a lot of people at Whiskey Fest itself. And so that was about four and a half weeks out from the festival. So we reached out to uh, the Whiskey Fest people and, and let them know we were being petitioned to put something together. They gave us their blessing. They said, we fully understand what's going on. Go ahead. So in four and a half weeks, we put together a festival called Whiskey Jubilee. It was at uh, at a synagogue uh, near B&H Video, if I remember correctly, or B&H Photo. And, uh, you know, there's maybe 20 tables and you know brands launched there right we had nika launch at whiskey jubilee um which was fantastic and, and it was a completely kosher catered event so so there were there were there were key things for us we were whiskey dorks who hated going to whiskey festivals only to see pretty women in slinky dresses or handsome guys in nice suits pouring you whiskey, not knowing anything about the whiskey that they were pouring you. Right. And we also knew that for our kosher keeping friends, it wasn't always easy for them to eat. They quite often had to pay a bit of an upcharge to get kosher food. So we said, this is what we're going to do. This is going to be 100% kosher catered. And anybody behind a table has to be brand direct or has to, you know, be able to speak intelligently about the product. They could be beautiful. It doesn't matter so long as they can speak intelligently about the product, but it was specifically no models allowed. And over six years, we, we started in New York and over six years, we expanded to Chicago and Seattle. And I would say we started off with um, attendees to the festival being 100% Jewish and probably 99% male to maybe a 60-40 or 50-50 split of non-Jewish to Jewish, and maybe a 65-35 or 70-30 split of male to female. So it really became diverse. You had the Jewish clientele, which saw the value of kosher food. 
and then you had the 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 female clientele and and the male clientele who were also annoyed by the models who said you know what i can go here and actually learn about product and we would cap the number of tickets we sold we'd never wanted to oversell because sometimes you go to a festival and all you could do is stick your arm out and hope that liquid gets inside the glass you're holding on to no 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 we wanted people go to the festival learn what you're drinking about get some knowledge right and what's judaism about it's it's learning right it's lifelong learning so we wanted to incorporate all of these different elements so it was it was noticeably jewish to the jews and maybe not as noticeable to the non-jews but still jewish <laughs> <laughs> and uh yes, yeah. you know when, yeah so so th so that was the festival um and you know we we still do it to this day you know we, we never kosher certify our whiskeys that that's never been our aim but you know we we follow the the rules around pesach you know we we sell our whiskey for hummets you know we we want to follow all the rules and be you know release product that's good for everybody not just jews but but be proudly jewish yeah, no, it's wonderful. And I know that we could have a whole other session. And I, I do hope that at some point I'll have you back as a guest because there's so much more we could talk about. Uh, but I know that within the kosher whiskey world, there's a lot of debate. There are different, even within the more traditional end of Judaism, there are differences of opinions as to uh, what whiskeys are kosher or not. Lots of whiskeys are considered kosher without needing any kind of official heck share, a stamp saying that they're kosher. Uh, mm -hmm. But you were talking about m &H, you know, finishing their whiskeys in kosher wine casks uh, because some whiskeys get finished in casks that, you know, are, you know Spanish sherries and th things like that, that, that some within that community would not consider kosher because Correct. if the wine barrel or the, or the sherry barrel isn't, isn't kosher, then, uh, then they won't drink the product. Yeah, correct. And yeah, that, that really could be a conversation in and of itself, because you're right, you know, two people, three opinions and, <laughs> and all Very that. Very Jewish. And, right? <laughs> we Very could, we Jewish. could write the Talmud, <laughs> the Talmud on the, what is and is not kosher whiskey. <laughs> Absolutely. 100%, yeah. So in the time that we have, I would like to ask you about one other thing, which is, you know, you've talked about the, 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 the bottling company, the single cast nation. And I mm -hmm. think that uh, certainly I have experienced and purchased and tasted things that were from a bottling company. There are some very famous companies that all they do is they select uh, sometimes they're blending, but oftentimes they're selecting. They might age things a little differently uh, and they're bottling. And uh, and for lots of people who might be new to whiskey, there's not a good understanding of sort of why one does that. And you know, what's yeah. the difference between me buying an M&H bottle of Israeli whiskey versus having bought the single cast nation yeah. M&H cask? So it may be uh, just a, a few minutes to kind of paint in broad strokes what what is the work that you do the the way you have access to and select uh what what you choose to bottle and and, and the sure. role that that plays in in the business sure yeah so you know independent bottling is is really an interesting topic because most people don't understand what it is they they've never heard of it meanwhile it is what launched the whiskey industry now, independent bottling started back in the days of John Walker, the Chivas brothers, John Dewar, right? We know these names, Johnny Walker, Chivas Regal, Dewar's Blend, Usher's Blend, right? You know, these are all very famous whiskey bottlings, but these were all grocery store owners, you know, 200 plus years back. And what they were doing is they would go to a distillery and I'm just going to pull, you know, names out of the sky, right? You know, John Walker would go to McAllen and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm interested in bottling some of your whiskey for my grocery store. Say, ah, not a problem. So he selects the whiskey that he likes and he puts it in his bottle and it'll say John Walker's McAllen and he puts that on the shelf. And then when that's sold off, he's got to put something new to satisfy his customers. So he goes to Glenlivet distillery and now he's bottling john walker's glen livet and so he has something new meanwhile the people like mccallan said wait a second this isn't like the other thing and the people like glen livet said ah, i tried the mccallan one that wasn't great i like the glen livet one right and so he, he was always dealing with 
ensuring his customers were always happy. And so as time went on, he got into blending to create a consistent product. But that blending started with the idea of independently bottling whiskey from a distillery he didn't own, just that he purchased from. And now things like this went on for years and years and years and years. When, when we think of single malt whiskey, single malt whiskey wasn't even a, a marketable product until the 1960s. I can't remember if it was Glenn Livett or Glenn Fittick, but one of them became the first distillery to market their whiskey. And that was in 1965, 1966. And it, it wasn't even until the 1980s, which is only 40 some odd years ago, that single malt started gaining the prestige that it was. So what single cast nation does where we buy whiskey from distilleries or whiskey from brokers that will buy bulk spirit from distilleries, right? What we're doing is in line with how the industry grew over the past 200 plus years. So what we're doing is the most traditional form of whiskey, bottling, releasing, selling. And so some people might say, well, why would a distillery give you their best stuff? Uh, surely they're going to keep that for themselves. The fact of the matter is, you know, you've got about 120, well, actually closer to almost 140 distilleries in Scotland now, let's say 120 major distilleries. And the vast majority of them do not produce spirit to be sold as single malt. They produce spirit to go into a blend. And even those that produce single malt, even if you're Glenn Livett or McAllen, right, some of the biggest names, only a portion of your malt whiskey is meant to go into a single malt. The rest of it goes into some sort of blend. And the fact of the matter is that spirit is sold to the blenders before it's even aged. And so these distilleries never get a chance to taste whether it's great or bad or, or whatever. And so we end up buying from quite often, and by we, I mean we within the independent bottling world, quite often buy from the brokers who sell us whiskeys that don't fit within the flavor profile of a blender who may buy from them. Hopefully this isn't too too complicated, too convoluted, but my point is, if you like Johnny Walker Black, there, there's a reason you like it, right? It has a flavor you enjoy, and you want to be able to go back to a shop year over year over year to get a bottle that you love, and it's always going to taste the same. The thing is, distilleries produce far more liquid than these blenders will ever need, and the flavor profiles are quite often beyond something that would fit within those blends to create the consistency. So those whiskeys that are outside of that flavor profile get sold on to independent bottlers like our, like us. And so it's still great whiskey. It just doesn't necessarily fit the flavor profile of that single malt distillery or the profile that, that, that would be in the blend. And therefore it has to go somewhere. At the end of the day, they're factories who make a commodity. And so we select the single casks that we fall in love with, that we would open our wallets for and hope that other people do. And, and, that's, and that's what it is. As an independent bottler, we bottle whiskeys that we love, and we let our customers come to us. If they like, if you loved this bottle, great. Share the news with your friends. If you didn't, that's fine. There's other independent bottlers you could try out or you could stick with don't, you know, your Glenn Livets or your McAllen's or, or whatever. Um, hopefully Thank that you. answered it all. Absolutely. No, it's, yeah. a, I think, a, a, as I said, a window into a world that I think a lot of people don't know very much about. And, you know, you're in it from the inside, because that's, you're, you're in the process of selecting, and, and that's what you're doing. And, and I think often people, particularly in the, the time we're living in now, people are so familiar with and the marketing and, and the, the sort of the reputation of some of those single malts that we forget that actually, even today, uh, it's a tiny fraction of the Scotch market. It's something like, oh, yeah. uh, I think, 10 percent of uh, the yep. output. It goes into single malts. Uh, it's you know, 20, about 20 percent of their income because they, they usually charge more for those. But right, we still have 90 percent of Scotch whiskey being sold around the world is going into blends. And, and there's excellent 
you know, and people, that'll be a whole other podcast episode, but people who turn their noses, you know, uh, down at, um, uh, at blended yeah. whiskies when there's, there's such excellent blended whiskies and blended blending companies doing wonderful work that, uh, I have, I have podcast episodes for many years to come to get to all of this. <laughs> But Joshua, this has been a wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, I think that people who haven't necessarily uh, spent a lot of time learning about the whiskey world will have learned an awful lot from you today. Uh, it's wonderful that we, you know, coincidentally crossed paths about 12 mm. years ago. And right back then, I was excited that you were interested in whiskey and to see the, the journey that you've been on and uh where it's taken you has been wonderful. And now that you represent for impacts and uh, often traveling throughout uh, the Northeast, uh, I get to see you up in my neck of the woods in Massachusetts mm -hmm. uh, several times a year. So I'm looking forward to continuing that connection and getting to try more of the whiskeys that you get to bring us. Um, so thank you for being a guest on A Dram and A Drash. And I'm gonna pick up uh, the m &H Single Cast Nation one more time. And wish you l'chaim. L'chaim. Delicious. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of A Dram and a Drush. As always, would love to receive your comments and your feedback. You can do that on my website at rabbirg.com. You can also contact me via the Facebook page for A Dram and a Drush on Twitter and Instagram. All of those details are in the episode notes, as well as in the credits if you are watching the YouTube version. Hope to see you again next month. L'chaim.